Noun da, gan hyfrod Sue Shotter ad ui, croeso. My name is Councillor Sue Shotter and I am the Chair of the Social Care and Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Can I welcome everyone to the meeting today, which is a multi-location meeting. The meeting will be live streamed and recorded and will be available for viewing after the meeting. Should the live stream fail, the meeting will continue and a recording will be available through the Council's website following the conclusion of this meeting. Can I remind members that a translation facility is available and for those attending remotely to choose your language of choice. For those attending remotely, please note those in the chamber will be enabled to use the chat facilities. For those wishing to speak in the chamber, please raise your hand. For those attending remotely, please use the raised hand function. We will alternate between the speakers in the chamber and the remotees. Committee members who are attending remotely are required to leave the cameras on throughout the debate and when voting in order to maintain the integrity of the decision-making process. If you need to leave the meeting, pop a message in the chat function so the Democratic Service Officer is aware and then please let us know when you return. I expect everyone present and participating in this meeting to conduct themselves appropriately and be respectful to each other. That applies to members, officers and anyone in the public gallery. When I open up the debate, I will ask committee members to speak their questions first, following by non-committee members. While I do not wish to stifle debate, can I remind members any questions should be focused on the subject matter and to avoid repetition. If I feel the length of an individual speeches are negatively impacting on the overall time for discussion and becoming unmanageable, I will defer to the committee's rule and procedure, which limits the length of speeches to five minutes. Dioch. Let's move on to the agenda item. Apologies for absence. Committee Jane, Service Officer Jane Jones, are there any apologies? Just one apology, Councillor Louise Emery. Deal. Agenda item two, declaration of interest, code of local government. Members are reminded that they must declare the existence and nature of the declared personal interest. Any declarations? No, doesn't look like there are. Thank you. Agenda item three, urgent matters. No urgent matters. Deal. Agenda item four, the minutes. To approve and sign, correct, the record of the minutes of the previous meeting on Wednesday, the 17th of January, 2024, pages four to nine. Members, we're going to take these pages individually. So we'll go to four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Do I have a proposer? Councillor Angie, do I have a seconder? Councillor Kay, thank you. Okay, members, if you could show your approval by the, ro the raising of your hands in the chamber and on Zoom. That's carried. Any against? Any abstaining? Thank you, members, that's been carried. Okay, we'll move to agenda item five, to receive an update from Betsy Cadwalder University Health Board on orthopaedic services across North Wales. Can I welcome and thank Mr. Robert Kane on behalf of the committee for attending today. Thank you, Mr. Kane. If you'd like to take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, am I okay to share my screen so I can put the presentation up? Yes, of course. Can you all, or one of you confirm you can see this okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry. Okay, so uh, thanks for welcoming me onto this meeting again. I think it's the third time I've attended this uh, particular meeting over the past few years, and it's always quite insightful. And uh, thank you for inviting me a third time. So the way I've positioned this paper is just... Uh, I've updated the slides from the previous presentation so that it's easier for you to compare where we were against where we are now. So hopefully you'll be able to see that as we go through. Um, it's only a few slides long, so just bear with me and hopefully we'll we'll have time for questions at the end. So if you can focus your attention on the bottom table, this is uh, the change position from where I was last time, where we were in the health board last time in orthopedics, to where we are now. Um, 
we've actually seen a 36% reduction in stage one. Now, for those of you that are less familiar, stage one is those patients that are waiting for their initial appointment with the orthopedic surgeon or the clinician. Um, they've been referred from the GP and they're waiting to be seen. So we've seen a 36% reduction, which is very commendable to the clinical staff who have managed to achieve that reduction. Um, however, what that actually materializes in is a increase to the stage four. So stage four is those patients waiting their treatment, their procedure, their total hip replacement or total knee replacement or other orthopedic surgery. So seeing so many patients at stage one will only result in an increase in the stage four waiting list because whereas we can see 60 to 70 patients in a day at stage one, we can only see six or seven a day at stage four because requiring a an orthopedic procedure obviously takes a lot longer than requiring an assessment. Um, so that's why we've seen an increase. However, what we have seen is um, a reduction in the longest waiting patients at most stages. So at 52 weeks and at 104 weeks, we've seen largely reduction in, in waiting times at those levels at both stage one and four, which again is an improvement in our waiting list position, much better than what it was a year ago when I presented last time. Uh, I talked last time about Get It Right First Time, the GERT visit in, in February 2022. We're now 78% complete with those recommendations. They gave us 46 recommendations, mostly local recommendations. Some of them were national recommendations, um, of which all health boards in Wales received a copy of the same recommendations nationally. We're 78% complete with those now um, and well on our way to achieving those by the end of this um, this year. And we also received in the same year, 2022, a national blueprint for orthopedic surgical delivery, which is the Welsh Orthopedic Network document to provide a model of services within Wales and a, a forward journey of where we should be going over the next few years. Uh, for us in North Wales, that meant that we needed to build a standalone orthopedic centre, um, which we have now got in Abergelly, and we are planning, uh, planning, we are actually currently building in Clandidno which I'll talk about a bit more in a few moments. Um, we've got lots of orthopedic initiatives. Some of these are, are, are the reason for the reduction in waiting times that you saw on the previous slides. I'll, I'll go through some of them, but these are just a few of the ones that we've got. So we've now got virtual joint schools and in-person joint schools um, throughout the health board in each of our local uh, health um, communities, East, West and Centre. We've got an increase in hip and knee surgery day case uh, procedures, which is fantastic because they don't need the uh, premium beds overnight. Um, we've got high volume, low complexity surgery going on, which is basically the more simple uh, non-complex cases, which, which uh, we can get through quite quickly to get patients treated and managed as fast as possible so that they obviously get the relief that they require. We've got pockets of robotic surgery, coming up and becoming more prevalent as we uh, specifically in west but it's sort of materializing more in the east as well and we're also looking at how we can better use the clinical staff the non non orthopedic surgeon staff better to manage those waiting times that we've that you've seen on the previous slide um, abigail and clendid no i've mentioned already i'll just talk a little bit more about abigail so abigail is is uh, our short stay arthroplasty hub um, for hips and knees. We've had that in place in September. We did have Abigaili as a elective centre for the Central Integrated Health Community. Uh, now we've got it as just elective hip and knee replacements. So we, we made that change because we saw the cohort of patients was increasing in for hip and knee replacements and we needed to have a dedicated resource to manage that waiting list. It also served as an opportunity to prove the case for Clendidno Phase 1, which is now being approved by the Health Board and Welsh Government and actually is being built as we're, as we're talking, uh, due to be completed in December of this year. Uh, in terms of our plans going forward, so if I develop this a little bit further than what we had last time in the last uh, presentation a year ago, we're maximising the use of Abigail to get as many patients treated and managed as we can um, to reduce that Stage 4 waiting list. We're implementing our GERF deficiencies and the recommendations. Like I said, we're 78% of the way through and uh, we're completing those fairly rapidly now. And we're doing our best to regain 
where we've lost them and sufficiently ring fence the acute site orthopedic beds. Those beds are essential for the more complex high risk patients, uh, which we can't treat in Abigail. Um, and we might not be able to treat in Clandidno. We do still need those ring fenced acute site beds. In the medium term, we're looking at completing Clandidno orthopedic unit on time. Um, like I said, December time and continued focus on the, uh, uh, reduction in waiting times for orthopedic elected patients. And in the long term, uh, Clandidno actually may have a phase two. And we're hoping for that phase two to be more orthopedic services so that we can not just take hip and knee replacements there, but we can take all elective orthopedic surgery to Clandidno as a North Wales hub, which will then create an orthopedic and MSK centre in Clandidno because it already has plenty of other MSK specialities operating out of there. Okay, I hope I haven't rushed through that too much, and I appreciate any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Kane. Um, I'm just going to ask the committee if there's any questions. Um, Councillor Paul? Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, can I just clarify some more information about uh, the Clandidno Phase 1? Yeah. Um, what are the... Uh, well, are there detailed plans going forward? you know, phase two, three, or, or whatever. And if there are, what are they? And when? what is the timetable for those? So phase one is a mirror image of Abigaili, plus a few other um, additions to make it more inclusive in terms of the wider patient cohort, because Abigaili is restricting the number of patients we can take there for various reasons. So it's a development on that. Abig Phase one in Clandidno is a refurbishment of a ward. It's the addition of two brand new theatres. It's an extension to the radiology department. And it is a new, bigger recovery area on this side of the theatres. Um, that's due to be finished in December of this year. Phase two, um, again, I need to clarify, phase two is currently in the modelling phase of what we ideally need phase two to be in terms of what speciality. So is it orthopedics? Is it urology? Is it ophthalmology, et cetera? We're looking at the numbers now to see where the greatest need is so that we can decide what phase two will be. But even once we've decided that, it doesn't necessarily mean we've got the capital or the revenue monies to support it. We do need to work all that through. But we're in that stage now where we are modeling that in. Uh, phase three and four would largely depend on what phase two is. Um, I can't give you a timeline for phase two. We, at the moment, we've just gone out within the health board to an options appraisal to look at which specialities would uh, require the use of the facility. Um, and that's for the executive team to be uh, more informed. And then I'm assuming that that would then be pushed out wider for wider consultation. Hope that answers at least some of the question. So, so just let me fully clarify. So, um, in a sense, we're not in terms of phase two, the, if you like, the business plan for phase two has to be worked up and then sent off to Welsh government. Yeah, we haven't uh, got we haven't got the business plan for that. We're writing it as we as we speak. And that business plan will focus on Clandidno again. Yeah, well, well, well oh, the. The emphasis is around Clandidno because it's phase one is in Clandidno. We can't say that it will be Clandidno. Uh, it may be that it isn't phase two of Clandidno, that the additional activity goes into a different site. But again, this is part of the options appraisal. Okay. But sensibly speaking, um, and theoretically speaking, because of the work that we'll be doing to increase the capacity in Clandidno, it would make sense, although I accept it requires further consultation and engagement for that phase two to actually happen on Clendido as well. Thank but you very much. A, it isn't a foregone conclusion. No, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kane. We've got another question from Councillor Liz on Zoom. Thank you very much indeed for coming back to us to uh, share the update on, on uh, your, the orthopaedics. And it's so pleasing to see Clandidno Hospital being used um, 
because we all knew at one stage that it, you know, there were less and less services from there. So I'm so pleased to see the expansion of the orthopaedic surgery there. Um, can I mean, do you have any statistics on how well the exercise by referral scheme is supporting the work, um, well, the orthopaedic? Um, um, I know we can, I can get statistics from our department in Conway, but I was just wondering if from your perspective, you know how well it's used in supporting patients whilst they're awaiting surgery. And the other one is, um, can you share a little bit more about the robotic surgery you're using these days? Because that's quite an exciting development, isn't it, really? Thank you. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics to hand about the National Exercise Referral Scheme. I do know that there are um, changes to how it's been used to benefit those patients waiting for surgery. Um, almost like a waiting well or active waiting type approach. Um, it, it's difficult to answer it uh, because we've got lots of different pieces of work that feed into and out of National Exercise Referral Scheme. Um, we've got something called the three Ps policy, which is an all Wales mandate, which, we, which ties into National Exercise Referral Scheme, but also social prescribing and signposting. Um, but to answer your question, I, I can't, I don't have the statistics to hand right now to tell you exactly what, particularly not in the central integrated health community, how how National Exercise Referral Scheme has been used to, to change the outcome of those patients waiting for surgery. I can try and get it for you. I'm happy to have a chat to you offline if you want to, me to get more detail on that for you. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that, please, because I know there have been changes via public health on the Exercise by Referral Scheme. And... I wouldn't want to see its depletion um, because it, it is such a wonderful scheme. So I wouldn't mind speaking with yourself and with um, Mally, who manages the service here in Conway, uh, to see how we can maybe improve on understanding more of how it's supporting orthopaedic services. Yeah, ha more than happy to. Uh, I don't know how we set that up. Uh, Dawn or Jane can sort out uh, for us to yeah. talk or meet. We'll I'll happily do it, yeah. Uh, in okay. terms of the robotic surgery, sorry, your, your second question. The robotic surgery yeah. is um, mainly happening in in West, and it's part of a um, a company called Zimmer Biomets, which basically uh, create implants for hip and knee replacements, mainly hips at the moment, but some knees, and they're moving on to shoulder replacements as well. They created a robot um, and com uh, paired up with a with a company called Rosa. Um, and they have created this. It's not robotic surgery in the sense that you might think a robot does all the work. It's, it's, it's more in the way of navigational surgery. So the robot tells the surgeon where to do the operation. It's, it's telling them how to cut more accurately so the prosthesis, the implant, actually lasts longer and it works more effectively and it's more aligned to the patient's anatomical structures so it's more natural it isn't one of these press go and the robot does all the surgery for you it's still largely heavily reliant on the surgeon which is which is not a bad thing not a bad thing um so yeah does that answer some of the questions about the robotic surgery yeah that's excellent thanks very much indeed thank you thank you Deal, councillor liz um mr kane Dawn, we'll share your details after the meeting, if that's okay. Perfect, yeah. Yeah, okay. I will then call in Councillor Joe on Zoom. Deal. Um, Robert, the reduction in waiting times, is this due to less patients coming through or a more efficient um, system in, in, in processing patients? And also, what levels are there of cancellations of orthopaedic appointments, um, whether once, twice or three times, please? So... Yeah, in part, it's due to the waiting time reduction. In part, is due to um, episodes of reduced activity. But then, other times of the year, we also have increased activity. So it's difficult to say it's it's only due to that. Um, it's due to solutions that we've put in place. We've increased the throughput in clinics. We've changed the model of the clinics to get more patients through and seen and treated. 
Um, we're still continuing to treat in turn at stage one where we where we can, um, but recognizing we still need to optimize the capacity within the clinics and fill the clinics, which might mean sometimes we treat slightly out of turn. Um, it's due to lots of different things. It's basically we've had to think outside the box since COVID and change the way that we we operate the clinics. Um, but in part, yes, it's uh, we've seen slightly less demand as well. Uh, the other question was, sorry, was, um, can you repeat the second half? It was cancellations. Yeah, the cancellations, what level, what percentage of cancellations are operations cancelled once, twice or three times? That would depend on where in the health board we are, okay? Um, and at the moment in Wrexham, we're, we've lost our orthopedic acute site beds, so those operations have been cancelled more regularly because of a, a planned restart, but the medical patients coming through the doors in ED uh, necessitate that they need the beds, so we can't have them back, therefore we have to cancel them again. Uh, in centre and in west, much, much less. Um I can't give you a once, twice, or three times because it, it, we don't work it out like that. Um, ca rates of cancellation are no different this year than they were last year than they were the year before. It, it's um, And pre-COVID as well, we're about on a par. But for East at the moment, like we were in West last year, we lost the beds. It's just one of those medical pressures situations, unfortunately, which is all the more reason for building Clendidno. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Joe. Any more questions, members? No. I've actually been asked by a resident to ask you a question. It's, the question is, is there any chance that Clandidno Hospital could have a fracture clinic in situ? Or if not, is there any possibility that one can be planned for the future? Well, I guess the, the answer is never say never, that there there is no reason why Abigail could not have a fracture clinic in situ. Um, it's got all the services that a fracture clinic would require. Uh, the only barrier, in essence, would be having capacity in the outpatient department to house it. I know that Clendidno outpatients is fairly heavily used. Um, it would be carving out that capacity to actually use it as part of the Clendidno development. We're not planning on building any outpatient rooms. This is all stage four theatre capacity. Um, but to answer your the resident's question, it would be possible. It would just be a case of what could we take out of the outpatient department to put a fracture clinic in, which isn't an easy answer. Oh, that's wonderful. I will make sure that they get to hear the answer. And I've got one more question from Councillor Benice on um, Zoom. Councillor Benice? Thank you, Chair. You said at the beginning of your presentation, I might have got it wrong, my apologies if I have, that you hadn't decided yet whether the facilities at Clandidno were going to go for urology, orthopaedics, or something else. Yeah. Are there plans to actually go from one to the other so that once the orthopaedic waiting lists have come down you will have freed up um, theatre time you'll have freed up beds is there some way that those can be reallocated quickly to tackle the other long-term waiting lists? Theoretically, to answer your last question, yes, you could reallocate to different special. A theatre is a theatre. Um, orthopaedic theatres require certain uh, levels of equipment in it, which would be a bit of a waste of money if we were using it for a non-orthopaedic speciality. And the beds on the ward are beds on the ward, so yes. Um, theoretically, that is possible, but that isn't the plan. The plan is to build and locate and operationally streamline and make it as efficient as possible for the long-term sustainable future elective orthopedic hip and knee replacements phase one phase two um you asked a question about what are the other specialities that could 
have phase two, if we had a phase two, if it was in Clendidno. Um, and they are uh, made up of what the Get It Right First Time organization, which did our uh, review in yeah. February 2022, they have a, what we call it, a basket of high volume, low complexity surgeries. This is the efficient surgeries that we can get through really quickly to make best use of these theatres. I, if I, my memory serves me right, it's um, women's health and gynecology, ophthalmology, ENT, orthopedics, um, and I think it's urology. Those are the five. So those would be the five specialities we'd be looking to put through the options appraisal um, if phase two was to happen. Yeah. It, just to follow up slightly, I know equipment for the various things vary, but if we tackle one waiting list and they're highly successful, it's reallocating that service to tackle the other waiting lists rather than allowing those to grow. That was the reason behind. And we're spending an awful lot of money, which is well needed for orthopedics. But then if we cure that one, we're stuck with other waiting lists and those are growing. You know, I mean, the one that springs to mind, which you probably couldn't do in Candid now, is the vascular surgery is actually in dire straits and many of the patients are being relocated to other health courts, which is not good for the other health, for the patients or their visitors. Yeah. Thank you. I think just to, just to come back on that is... Um... That building, this elective cold site, as we call them, in Clendidno, or what we've currently got in Abigaili, it's almost a test, a proof of concept, if you like, whereas it's going to maintain for orthopedics. But I think all the surgical specialities also know they want something similar. And it may well be that when phase one in, in Clendidno shows to be able to treat patients 12 months of the year successfully efficiently with good outcomes for the patients then they will then look at can we create the same for some of the other surgical specialities thank you thank you councillor benice councillor councillor liz i'll call you in again <laughs> thanks very much indeed chair I'd just like to support a councillor Sue really in, in her suggestion about having fracture clinic in San Didno. Because if you're not phase, you know, looking at phase two and the option appraisal, if there was a fracture clinic, it would free up a lot of time from the district hospitals. So I just wondered, you know, in, in the bigger picture, whether it's something that could be considered. Yeah, I mean, nothing is out of the scope of consideration. Um, Clandidno is a is a is an odd venue because part of the hospital falls under the West Integrated Health Community, and part of it falls under the Centre Integrated Health Community. Lo locally, location wise, geographically, it, it's in Centre, it's in Conway, um, but the majority of the clinical work is run by West. So, the first question would be which integrated health community puts their fracture clinic there or do both do it you know um but again it, it is it's not out of the realm of possibility it would just be looking at what we removed from the outpatient department to be able to fit it in and what consequences would that have as well as the benefits of putting the fracture clinic there it's something i'm happy to take forward within the health board i can certainly um yeah. take it a bit further and see where we get to with it That'll be good. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, councillors, and I echo that support. Um, members, do we have anybody else that would like to ask a question? No, doesn't seem like there is. Can I first thank you, Mr Kane, for coming today and giving us your expertise and your time. It really has been appreciated. And hopefully in 12 months' time, you will come back to us and give us an update. And hopefully by then, we will be down the road of phase two, as Councillor Paul has said, in the favour of Clandidno. <laughs> I don't want to be biased, but with a bit of luck. And thank you yeah. so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.
You too. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye bye. Members, I'm now going to move on to agenda item seven instead of six. The agenda item is the question to cabinet member. Councillor David Carr has a question. Please, Councillor da Carr, could you read this question out for the committee and cabinet members? Diochenvald. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me? Great. That's great. Uh, right, the question. The price of uh, telecare services for the, for the elderly, disabled and vulnerable in Conway that, that provides vital life-saving assistance in an emergency is set to increase again in April after, the, after an extortionate 70% rise only a few months ago in September. It, it is disappointing that yet again there's been no meaningful consult, consultation and, and very little notice given to the vulnerable people who are dependent on this lifeline, which for many can make the difference between life or death. After the last price hike, our most vulnerable residents were left paying the highest telecare costs in Wales. To, to impose a further increase may be seen as inconsiderate, un, unsympathetic and very mean-spirited. What would you need to know in order to see this issue differently? and cancel this increase in the cost of telecare for our most vulnerable residents. Thank, thank you, Councillor David. Um, I am going to get a reply from Councillor Penny. Diochenvard, Councillor Penny. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carr, for your question. I've been in discussion regarding the whole financial position of social care since my appointment as Cabinet Member. I'm very clear about the direction of travel to ensure sustainable services and least harm to our vulnerable residents. In total, to meet the budgetary challenge, social care have 13 areas of budget reduction to deliver this year. One of these areas includes the viability of our telecare service. This is not, in effect, a service cut, but a proposal now agreed at full council last week to ensure that the service can provide to be offered at a competitive and cost-effective rate. In order to do this, we needed to increase the charge by a modest 18 pence per day, which equates to a total of one twenty-six per week, £1.26 per week. Therefore, a total cost of £7.21 per week. We are sadly no longer able to subsidise chargeable services owing to the financial challenge as suggested. As a team, we will monitor this carefully and where individuals make the case for hardship, we will review the, cha the charge in accordance with our policy. We have approximately 2,000 people who use the service. When we increased the charge last year, we saw very little impact and supported a small number with either reduced or no charge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Penny. Councillor David, would you like to come back? Yeah, firstly, the Council's own report actually says this will have an adverse impact. So I think we should actually listen to what our own reports say. I think it is a priority, really, and we are very semi-detached from people when we're increasing services that are vulnerable yet again after increasing in September. I mean, I mean, many of the elderly have paid, 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 in, paid in all their lives, you know, and uh, really <laughs> having to pay again, you know. But I don't, I don't think myself we should profit from the bubble. We have to be mindful. We've no day centres in it. No day. We have no day centres in this county. The disabled transport was cancelled. I think that was the year before last. You know, really, it's cut after cut, really. And uh, it seems to me right that, that it is very mean spirited to make this this extra cut. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm not going to go into all the things. I think it went to in the budget. All the things the council. I don't agree with the council spends its money on. But this is something we should spend our money on, really. Really, and it's the most vulnerable. Do you know, and I've worked in that sector, and I've seen how vulnerable people. There's a lady that I was looking after, and uh, you can't have somebody there all the time. She fell out of the bed in the middle of the night, and paramedics didn't didn't come straight away. They came after a few hours, saw she was all right, and put her back into bed. These are the kind of services that are most vulnerable, and these people are not wealthy people. You know, so people that have been disabled all their lives living in social housing these these are not wealthy people and and the extra charge does make an impact it's all very well saying to us you know it might not seem a lot of money so if you're on a very fixed income and you're elderly or disabled it does make an impact so that's that's what i'm saying we should actually look at our own report uh, which says there is an adverse impact and i think we should cancel this having had a big increase last september we should cancel this increase that's my view thanks for your help thank you very much 
Councillor Carr. Um, Councillor Penny. Thanks, Council uh, Chair. I'm not going to make this very long. This was already voted through at Council last week, Councillor Carr. The um, charge is not profit-making. It's not even a cost-neutral service at the moment. We have a day centre at Lyselian. We have lots of community-run venues that we run for elderly, and um, it, we will constantly review it. So thank you very much for your question. Thank you very much, Councillor Penny. OK, members, um, I'm going to now move on to agenda item six to review the forward work programme, pages 10 to 14, and the combined work programme, pages 15 to 41. Can I remind members that they only raise topics related to the remit of this committee? Dawn Hughes, Service Committee Officer, will present this agenda item. Thank you, Chair. Um, afternoon, members. Um, so can I advise of the following? I haven't got much of an update. So the annual reports in relation to the corporate parenting board and the strategic multi-agency panel are scheduled for the next meeting on the 11th of April. And also you will have had reminders today for the self-evaluation of scrutiny session on the 14th of March. So um, that's an online session. So I'd urge all members to attend. So that's the updates. Thank you very much, Dawn. Do I have a proposer? Councillor Austin, and do I have a seconder? Councillor Angie. Okay, members, if we can now go to the vote by a show of hands on in the chamber and on Zoom. Thank you, members. Anyone against? Any abstaining? Okay, members, that has been carried. And can I say that um, I think that's it for this afternoon. I hope you have a lovely afternoon, everybody. Can I thank Dawn and Jane for all their assistance, the officers for attending and the cabinet members as well. Thank you very much. Pranam, Dar. Yeah. Thank you.